Yeah, yeah, everything is fine. I can see you and I can hear you properly as well. Am I audible to you? Is it good? It's amazing. And I love your bookshelf. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Your your nice gaming chair. Are you uh <laughs> and, I have, and I have that gaming console as well. <laughs> what do you yeah. like? Call of Duty? What do you play over there? Yeah, you're bang on. Call of Duty is my like favorite game. Nice. Nice. What about you? Do you like like games? I was a huge gamer for a long time and mm -hmm. then um you know had kids and oh. now they're the gamers and you know <laughs> I just watch. But now you enjoy now you enjoy with them. Yeah, but I have an 8-year-old and he's really into soccer and um his season just ended and he's bringing all his friends over. He's 8 and we're mm -hmm. doing a FIFA tournament in the in the studio here. So oh. we'll have we'll definitely That's have great. some games going on today. But actually, I don't know if you'd be able to see this. Over in the corner over there is a retro. You see the game? Oh. The stand-up? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's got Pac-Man, Galaga. Mm. Galaga was my was my game growing up. So I like to Yeah, I I I remember back then in childhood, we also used to, you know, go to those gaming parlors and you know, they used to have these game that's games right. Like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, thanks, uh, Joe, thanks, for, thanks for having me. No, it really means a lot to me. I, I I appreciate you took time and you know doing this. Really, thank you so much. So I I want to start uh, with like uh, you know tell me about like yourself, uh, your journey. How did you get into photography and how how did it all happen for you? Yeah, um, a long time ago, um, mm -hmm. my grandfather gave me a camera for my birthday one year and. You know, I was always like a a pretty artistic kid. You know, I was always getting my hands on whatever I could creatively. I drew a lot. Um, I was like into guitar and I wrote poetry. You know, I was just that kid who just liked to read comics. Just a curious kid. Curious kid. And and so my grandfather, who was a very good photographer, um, mm. decided that, you know, and I was always fascinated with his camera and would watch him when we would travel he was always the one taking pictures and stuff and so mm. he got me a nicormat 35 millimeter slr um all metal it was like it was kind of known as like the tough nikon substitute you know like a lot of um a lot of journalists photojournalists would use that off in the war and things like that mm. so um so i got that and what was cool about it was that it when you adjusted the aperture it would actually darken and lighten the image a little bit so you get a little bit of an idea of what your right. image was going to be like so that really helped me kind of understand it um and i fooled around with it you know i would i would use it you know like just uh, for fun and then um in college i started i studied fine art and mm. mostly sculpture drawing but i always had a dark room at school right. University of California, Santa Cruz. And um, so I would start going in the dark room and I had friends who were photographers and I started doing it more. Then mm -hmm. I got out, I got into commercial art and I was doing, I was agency creative director for, right. you know, a couple decades, but mm -hmm. I always like had this passion for it. And I always felt like it was out of reach. I always felt like being a photographer was one of those things where you needed money, you needed good equipment. Right. Um, and so I shied away from it because it was much easier for me to get clay or pencils, you know, than to I develop play, play. do film. And so, um, you know, when things went digital, it became accessible for mm. me. And right. in 2000, I got a nicer Nikon digital, you know, not the, not the D, but I, I did get like a, not like the D one or something, but I think I got a D 700 or, D300 mm -hmm. probably back then. And right. it was starting, you know, you had the good lenses, you had a sensor that was, you know, good enough. And I started right. really, and you could take more photos and more and more. And so that's when mm -hmm. I really started getting into it. And then I would say it wasn't, so that was 2000. And then it wasn't until some years later that I decided, boy, I really, I really want to do this serious. Yeah. And then it was, you know, by 2014, 15, 16, I was doing it 
three, four times a week I was going out and shooting, you know, even though I was still working at an agency. Um, right. And um, and then eventually it just happened. You know, it's a long, long, it took a long time. He, right. I don't, I feel like no one these days goes that long, you know. Right. <clears throat> Where you're we all drinking. want, we all want it like quickly. Yeah. And I get it, you know, and these days it's accessible. And so you can kind of do it in social media, lets right. you get out there and get yourself known. And, and so there's so much more available today to sort of quicken the journey. But mine was old school, long, long journey, found a whole other occupation and found my way back to it. So it was like, mm, right. So while you were working, uh, like as a creative director in the ad advertising agency, yeah, were you happy with your, with the job? Like what was the thing at that time? Yeah, that's a it's a really good question. Um, like, were you happy with whatever that you were doing there, or you you know there was this constant rustle in your head to do something else? Like, what was the situation at that time? I think there was both. You know, like mm -hmm. you do what you do, it makes you money, it creates stability, right. it has all these upsides. You know, like mm -hmm. making money is is important in our world. It's you know, very important. And, and so. You know, it satisfied that I wasn't, you know, doing finances. I wasn't a banker, right. you know, I was a creative director and that comes with, you know, some, some really nice high highs, you know, and, right. and right. Re right. respect and, and creative thinking and ideas. And, and there's a lot of collaborators in the creative right. field. Right. And so you get to work with other creative geniuses and that's fun. And you get, you know, a certain amount of recognition for what you do, mm -hmm. but like you said, you know, there was always this thing, you know, it was like, you always wonder like what more you can do with your talent, you know, than what I, you're doing. Uh, or you can find yourself in a position where you're doing something and wondering, boy, mm -hmm. would this talent be better served somewhere else? And um, I always had that nagging feeling that um, I could be, I could be doing something. And I was trained in fine art, not commercial art. Right, right. And, and did and you have like that kind of freedom over there? Freedom as a creative, what? creative yeah. director? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, you were, no... you, or you were supposed to do what you were told? Like, yeah, creative almost. director is not a very like, it's not as free as it, as you imagine it to be. You're um, yeah. The higher up you go on the creative side in commercial art, the more of a middle person you become. You know? mm, uh, right, you're this right. middle person between the client, the brief, you know, the strategy, the desired outcomes and a creative team that is coming up with ideas and you're trying to marry those two things together all the time and so yeah you do end up in a lot of brainstorms and right. where you're thinking up ideas but it's always toward this commercial goal and always you know carving away at it until you it becomes this you know this perfect right, right. advertising thing right. um so i was i wouldn't say um you know, I was like, I wasn't unhappy by any means, mm. but, but I did feel like I wanted to get back to the, to something that filled my soul a little bit. Right. Right, and, right, um, right. Photography just seemed like that was the thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And you talked about your grandfather, your, your grandfather was also a photographer. Yeah. How, how important do you think it is to have a person in your family from, you know, who's, who's also connected with a creative pursuit how much do you think that plays a role in a person's life in, a, in an artist's uh, life yeah i don't i don't i mean obviously you don't have to have it to be successful mm. but mm, i do right. think that it sets the seed in you very early you know mm. if you see a relative and let me just tell you why why exactly i want to ask this question to you like as far as my family is concerned there is like nobody there was nobody in my family who were who was like somehow connected to any artistic form so yeah. basically in my childhood it was very hard for me to you know convince my parents and my family members that okay this is something that i want to do so it was that 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 gap was always there so that's the reason why i'm asking you this question yeah yeah i think that you know those gaps exist in our families for all of us in some way right. whether it's a generational difference mm -hmm. or um you know, the classic is, you know, your family's all doctors and you're like, I want to be a dancer, <laughs> you know, I, that's like, there's, there's always these tensions between our families and what our pursuits are. And 
family is this pull, you know, there's family businesses, family owns a restaurant, you're going to go into the restaurant business, you know, and like you're taught these things early on. And, and so you have to, in anyone's individual life, you have to decide, am I going to swim downstream or upstream? You know, how am I, I going to, how am I going to do this? And having a family member who does art and creativity in some way makes it easier because you're not always going upstream against the family. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, my grandpa did this. I can do this too. But my grandfather, I will say, as good as his photography was, it was always a hobby. It was never his work. You know, okay. He he was, um, you know, worked in the garment industry and and worked hard, hard, hard. And then, you know, when he retired, he traveled and took photos. You know, so I got the luxury of seeing him after he'd already made his money and retired. Mm -hmm. and, and funny enough, that's kind of how I did it too. You know, I worked and worked and worked and then I'm not retired, but mm -hmm. I like to say rewired instead of retired because I'm rewiring, you know, how I right, look right, the world right. and think about what I do. Um, but to answer your question, I do, I think it's nice. You have someone close to you, you know. Who can understand your. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It helps mm. pave the way for sure. Right, right. And you also talked about, you know, something which is very like serious. You, you talked about money as well. Like money is very important, very, it plays a crucial role in, in a person's life. So yeah. do you, do you some, sometimes ponder about this thought? Like how much money is it important? Like in life? Money, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, do you think about these kind of philosophical questions every now and then? Yeah. Well, probably every day in some way, shape or form I'm, philosophizing on something um mm -hmm. but money is a big one you know i do think that you know the there's the larger bigger things of life you know right. love family security you don't need a lot of money for those big things you right. know but it depends what sort of what your goals are for you and your family essentially you know and what I've discovered over time is that the nice cars, the, you know, the better version of things you already have, the nicer sneakers, the, the new iPhones, uh, the new iPhones, those are less important. Um, first class travel doesn't appeal to me as much anymore. You know, the nicer hotels, it doesn't matter. Um, but I will say like being able to handle a health crisis, right. um, you know, having enough to sort of help your kids through school to get your kids through nicer places. And then whatever your passion is, in my case, mm -hmm. photography and filmmaking, right. that's an expensive passion. And so right. Right. To, to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to get that lens or mm -hmm. I'm going to get that new light, you know, or light modifier. In those places, money really does help you because you don't feel like you're being held back by equipment and by other things that sort of surround, you know, the, the genre or the, you know, the discipline you're in. And so I do think like, it's nice to be able to, uh, I think the right arc for a lot of people is to have the passion, foster right. the passion, but defer your sort of like full-time engagement in it until you've established it, when it's photography, um, until you've established yourself a little bit financially and, and become secure and stable because photography is so unstable as a profession. Yes, no so sure. So um, there's other professions, of course, that people love that are very stable that you don't need to have that same arc for. But if mm -hmm. photography is where you want to go, you know, you need to establish your platform, you know, so mm -hmm. that you can build up Right. You know, you don't have to be afraid of, of, you know, failing and what that mm -hmm. means financially, because with photography, the trends are always changing. There's these, uh, you know, superstars pop up in photography and suddenly, you know, you've worked whatever, seven, eight, nine years and suddenly some kid pops up and he's the most popular thing because right. he's got some incredible new fresh perspective and he's good with PR and like, that can change your business that can change, you know, and you don't want to, 
what you want is to be so stable that you know you're the mountain and everything else is the weather so you're doing what you do your themes what you like the way you like it and the rest of the world comes and goes you know from a trends perspective and you don't have to bend and adjust to all those trends because you're set you know and you've got your roots set in so that's why i think the longer journey in establishing some a base for yourself right. you know that is stable really helps you stay true to your own vision so basically the shelf life is like very short when it comes to photography or artistic mediums right that's what you were um, saying i think you um trends come and go they spike right. they go down you know we you see them even over the last 5 10 years of what's popular um right and and the effect social media has on that um mm -hmm. there are forms of photography that are evergreen you know jur mm -hmm. journalism photojournalism documentary documentary landscape you know there's there are things in that world that don't have to fluctuate so much with trends they you know you do right. them uh behind the scenes stuff um right. that's why i really love dance photography i just think there's mm -hmm. you know there's a classicism to that kind right. of photography that i really like right. um black and white that's why i like black and white feels same here i i'm also interested I'm, in black and white yeah yeah i myself so, into black and white yeah yeah so yeah please go on go on you were saying something no that was it just um you know you're talking about shelf life of photography i think it's the harder thing to withstand is your own you know making sure you don't get burnt out of it yes. too much right. um because there's this striving element to doing photography that can tire you out there's the constant hustle that can tire right. you out so it's finding your way to manage through the discipline where you have longevity you know but tell me tell me one thing how do you manage yourself in such a time when social media is like so overhyped and you know uh, everybody is like running around running behind those latest trends and glitz and glamour of social media yeah so when the whole system is built like that in 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 that scenario how do you manage yourself i mean what do you think about it well it becomes very to, hard at times yeah it is you have to acknowledge it's there you know i don't think you can simply say i reject it i'm leaving you know as right. a lot of people do they're like i'm stopping instagram um because it's unhealthy and because it's competitive and it's all the things you mm -hmm. said it's got us all chasing trends and stuff right it can do that if you treat it that way but but then there are no outlets there are no other outlets too yeah you just i think you just have to acknowledge it's there and reframe it for yourself what is the most useful use of social media for you you know that right. does make it healthy and what i've been hearing a lot is people saying i use social media differently now it used to be this pr place right. where my portfolio was all on there everyone found me there and right. i could essentially disintermediate the process of you know essentially having a rep because if my work was extremely popular uh people would see me and then they would hire me right people have changed from thinking of of instagram in particular as that entity and what they're now switching to is it's more like a journal you know right. or a behind the scenes mm -hmm. so my work sits over here it's in my portfolio and my portfolio is my website I and know. that's where all the beautiful large you know versions of my images are nicely cataloged and then over here in social media yeah you know every once in a while i throw things up and i talk about what i'm thinking about or my my views on life or maybe it's poetry or maybe it's a series of images that i just felt like you know stood out to me even though they weren't the main ones they were like right. these artistic other versions i think a lot of people are switching their mindset over to that and they're finding more joy in social media and that's right. that's how i've always treated 
social media. I mean, I suppose I used to do it more often. I used to post every couple of days, you know, mm. and. And are you still attention. like, still too, too like uh, often uploading photos on Instagram? Like uh, on my, social media? my pace is about once a week. I okay. throw something okay. up on there. Um, mm -hmm. Feels right. You know, I'm able, mm -hmm. what I like is I'm able to forget it exists for a few, I, you know, four or five days, sometimes mm -hmm. longer. I'm able to go on a vacation and not think about it or do a shoot, and, you know, or I get super busy and it's like, oh, I can't do it for two, three weeks. It doesn't affect me. doesn't affect my business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, when I feel like it, I come back in and I, I post something. I'm probably going to, I have something today I've been kind of like putting together, but it's more like a journal entry, you know, it's just more like I, it's fun. I don't track how many, I turn off like viewing how many people. Yeah. Mm. And I just do it. And those who like my work follow and, you know, I'm not hoping that it expands to the whole world anymore. Right, right, right. Because you cannot like, you know, uh, make everybody like your, like your work at the no. end of the day. No, and you can't even get in a position. You don't want to be in a mindset where that's your goal. Right, right, right. You want, I think it's old, it's old school. You know, it's like how musicians were when I was young. It was like, mm. you know, the idea of becoming Led Zeppelin or something, you know, was like, yeah, like that's one in a million chance I become the biggest rock band on the planet, you know, for... Right for a couple of years. It's really the journey. It's like, I really just want to be able to live off my music because I love making music. You know, it's what I loved about folk right. musicians is like, they're people who travel and gain experiences. Country music was like this too, mm -hmm. where the playing of the music, the having the experience of traveling and playing for in small venues and, you know, becoming integral to one, a person's night. You know, all I need mm. is I'm the soundtrack to your night tonight, you know, right. and you're helping create those experiences. And then it grows and grows and you get like a small fan base, you know, who buy your records. And if you have 500 people or a thousand people who buy your records, you know, every time you come out with one, great, you know, mm. you, that makes you some money, get, you get to book more gigs and it just becomes this, I get to play my guitar or my songs, you know, like mm. all the time for a living. And I feel like, we get to aim for that in photography now too. You know, like mm. this is a it's a beautiful living to be able to hold a camera right. and people have to do it and they want your vision on the world. And it's not about becoming the big rock star photographer. It's not right. having a million fans, you know, a million million followers and having shows and <laughs> all this stuff. It's mm. it's being able to do it day in and day out and providing photographs for people. You know, the, my, my, the truth is I have photographs going up on Instagram probably almost every day. This just doesn't go right. to my feed. You know, they goes to other people's feeds. Right. So like, if you look at my story, I'm usually reposting other, the photographs I've done that I do right. for other, other people mm. um, more than I do it on my own feed. But that to me is like being a traveling musician. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm a photographer. I, I do photographs for people. And uh, they they post them and they like them and that keeps me happy. You know. So basically, you just have to remember why you actually started doing photography. That's right. The, That's right. The basic things. And I was I was going through one of your interview on Medium. I just want to tell you one thing. Uh, I've been following your articles on Medium like from a very long time. I've oh, nice. So many. Yeah, I've read so many of them, and I've learned so much from like your articles. And I really want to thank you for that as well. Oh, so thank was, you. Yeah. So I was I was going through one of your interviews on on the website of Medium, and over there you talked about how photography starts with love, and it ends with apathy. Yeah. So I tried comprehend comprehending that statement, and uh, let me just share what I have like you know uh, understood from from that statement. So basically, yeah. what you meant was, we start doing photography or any art form for that matter. We start everything from from that curiosity, from that love, you know, from that, you know, uh, from that childlike curiosity. But with time, with time, we lose all these qualities, and we tend to focus too much on the on the technical part of photography, 
or the you know the qualities of photography we 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 tend to you know talk about all these things and in the process we lose that childlike curiosity we we lose we lose the track of why we actually started doing something like yeah i think am that's I, right? i think that's spot on um i think everyone who we we all seem the the quote was meant to sort of describe a what we all begin the journey on which is we all like hold this camera and we all fall in love and we're sort of mesmerized and romanticized by the possibilities that the camera offers us right. and there's a love in this and mm -hmm. the, and that relationship we have with the camera and with photography feels romantic you know it is romantic right. it's like it's all these artistic and creative possibilities and for some it stays forever right. but when it does end and it does for a lot of people um it ends because for some reason we stopped caring as much as we did you know right. but it can happen in a lot of different ways like the the apathy can be created like you said because we get too focused on the technical aspects of it or it can happen because we're not having the kind of success we imagine ourselves having with it it can happen right. because we never figure out how to make our images look like the images we want to make mm -hmm. um it can happen because you it can actually happen the other way which is you become wildly successful at it and you just do it and it becomes a repetitive process and after a right. while it's sort of, it's work and you know you're you're what felt magical in the beginning now has no mystery to it because i know right. exactly how i'm doing what i'm doing oh. and therefore it's more workman like and after a while workmanship you know becomes rote and right. Right. You know, just like any blacksmith you know like mm -hmm. i'm sure that that was amazing at first you're bending steel you know and in the end it's right. like God, it's another difficult day you know um it becomes a so repetitive process yeah the end so there's the lots of ways it can end but it always ends with that feeling of like yeah i just don't care about it as much as i used to care about right. it right right yeah and it's cool. it's a it's something we all have to contend with and struggle with even you know many famous people like cartier bresson who everyone refers back to you know on on the black and white photography thing he reached his peak at some point too you know and right. and was just sort of less interested in photography later on in his life so he'd done it so much you know right so i think we have to also embrace that a little bit and you know be be okay with it right you talked about henry cartier bresson he's like i really i really appreciate his work and uh, i want to tell i want to tell you that last interview that i had i i had my interview with martin par nice martin par was like one of his colleagues at that time as well yeah yeah martin par is amazing um definitely has carried through the um the artistry that right. cartier bresson had and um it's nice i it's my favorite type of photography i really i like timeless work i like black and white work i like you know i'm always aiming to create imagery that feels like it could be from any era um, right. and therefore will carry through you know into other eras hopefully later on or you know if it all gets replaced at least we'll be lumped in with a time period you know maybe a right. longer time period from turn of the century to whenever when photographers like us were doing you know a certain kind of work right 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 you know mm. so tell me how can a person you know really keep that childlike curiosity intact with time and do you think it is is it possible to keep that childlike curiosity forever with with you or do you think it 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 goes away after a time no curiosity childlike curiosity you can have forever your whole life there's no question um in fact you better keep it forever you know because right. when you lose it um 
it's not an all at once. It's not like you suddenly become an old man. You know, what happens like, is these teeny little cuts over time. It um, happens gradually. Yeah. And you see it out there when you're out in public, you see them, you know, these people behind the counter at Starbucks and, you know, like, you know, interactions, with other photographers on set with model, like you see it in people, you know, like the way they talk to you, this like, the one, the cue I always get is whenever someone has a paternal voice with me, mm -hmm. it always sounds jaded. It always sounds like they've lost. Like, why do you have to act like the father in this scenario? Right, 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 right. Because they're like, oh, well, you know, when you're my age, you'll see blah, blah, this. And it's a tone, you know, it's this like, right, right, right. and like, I try to always be the child, you know, and like keep that curious tone. But all to say that, yes, you keep it forever. It, the thing is that your curiosity may lead you away from photography. Um, and that part is very hard. I have felt that recently as I've gotten more. Yeah, that's what, that's what I wanted to ask you. Has yeah. that happened with you as well? Uh, yeah. And over the last few years, I've been embracing filmmaking, right. um, which is very similar to photography, shares a lot of things in common with photography. Mm -hmm. And, but there's a lot of other stuff. There's, you know, nonlinear editors, my color correction is different. Um, the tools you start realizing are different. You're you're not getting a still image. You're creating stories, which means there's scenes, wide angles, close ups. Right. There's, there's a whole other set of stuff to learn, which I've been hugely fascinated by. It's restoked my curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> photography, with how long I've done it, just can't do it the same way anymore. Right. You know, like. Not that I'm the best photographer, but I know there. I'm at a point now where there's no image you could show me I, I that I would that I wouldn't know how it was done. I know mm -hmm. how every image gets done at this point. Not that I could, you know, all the scenarios are different, the actors are different, the light, you know, will change, I, the I, environment, I, and cities are different. But like, it's like okay, I can see what direction that light was. I can see what the what the photographer was going for um i probably know what lens they used so um it's natural that in a situation like that my curiosity which is still here is going right. to aim itself at something else because i'm just not getting it from mm -hmm. photography mm -hmm. anymore it's not right. like it's not scratching that curiosity itch that medium and, has uh, to be changed like you have to find uh, other avenues as well yeah is that what you're trying yeah, and you know what? I think this happens to a lot of people at my age. You know, I'm in my 50s now, and you know, we become what they call polymaths. You know, where where we're right. we're interested in a lot of different things because our curiosity stays, but we need more. You know, we need more to feed it. And now right. I'm interested in I'm trying to like get better at writing, get better at um, poetry, you know, music, filmmaking, so poetry, music. Yeah, I've been writing some music again, and. And it's okay, you know, the there's the sense in your 20s, 30s, and even into your 40s that you need to focus really hard on one thing. Right. And everyone tells you that. Like, right. if you want to be great, you got to do it every day. Do that one thing to the exclusion of everything else. Mm -hmm. And so you get in that mindset and you have to kind of undo that a little bit, you know, as mm -hmm. you as you move in. As you get older and and you you're able to absorb a little bit more and see more and do more, you know other things you have to let those other things in and start to round yourself out you know or some of us like to you know and do you often often you know find yourself thinking that photography has become like too short for you to like you know express yourself now you need a larger medium to express yourself and photography is not enough now um for you to express things that's a good question I think I could express myself just with photography. I do. Mm. I, I think it's um, it's a it's such a beautiful medium. Right. <clears throat> the the kind of work I like to do, like, comes across well in a still image, you know. Right. And I can pack a lot in there. Yeah, so you can condense that in a photograph as well. Yeah, I you know, if I were as passionate about it as I was 15, 10 years ago, you know. Mm -hmm. I could certainly still be putting images out, still images out, and feeling like I was expressing myself um, really well. But 
it's not the same as expressing yourself through writing, um, which as you know, because you've been reading the articles I've been doing since, you know, 2016. And um, it's not the same as making a film, which I'm finding some real joy in doing. Um, and there are things in short films that are just so different. It, 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 it's emotional in a totally different I way because people have to pay attention for a length of time. You know, with a photograph, right. you can look at it, you're like, that's cool, swipe, you know, move on. But right. with a with a film, you know, you've got people captured for anywhere from three to five to 20, 30 minutes or longer if you're doing a feature film. So um, what do you do with the person's time when you have them right. for that long? It's totally different. But that's, it's just different. It's not, I wouldn't say it's better form of of for me of expressing myself hmm. you know it starts to get into what are your personal themes and and you know what are the things you feel like you have to say to the world I, and you know if you've you've looked at my instagram it's like it's a combination of the images but also the words uh, the captions and poetry I, that kind of go with it i always feel like those two things are working together in terms of my own expression, you don't have to read read the captions or go through all the images. But if I'm putting it out in the world, imagery plus whatever's Words. in my head, yeah, expressed through prose or poetry, you know, I, kind of kind of conveys everything I feel in a moment, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that that to me is the ultimate expression. <clears throat> I feel what you want after you've put something out in the world is actually to feel like I want to do something totally different. I want to go on a walk or I want to eat a meal or I want to like play like, soccer, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. That's how, you know, you really ex got it all out because nothing's left. You know, you're like, right, right. like that was, that you was feel good. that emptiness within you. Yeah. And it's really good. I like, I, I feel like you're expunging, you know, like, it's like a it's like puking you know like i just like get that, get that all out it's really good yeah you want to have that sense of nothing and now i, get and to I build guess up and things. and i guess it's a never-ending process like you keep on doing this, this again and again yeah like you you there is so much that goes inside your head and at last you spit it out from your head and then again after some time there are other things that you want to say and then again it all it, it's a repetitive process that you keep you have to like keep doing i think so i think that's the right way to make art because you know if you hold stuff in the reason you do is because of fear um which is natural but you you wonder how people are going to feel about it when you put it out right. Right. and <clears throat> there's the fear that people won't like it but there's also the fear that they'll like it fine that this thing you felt so deeply about is kind of like okay you know nice you know and that people don't like it's not some big crowd cheering for you you know when you I, put something out in the world and that can hurt that can be very difficult for people and so what they do this is very common is they hold it back because they're like mm. i don't want to put it out in the world because i don't want to get lukewarm <clears throat> feedback for it so i don't they, want to get i don't want to get neglected or yeah. i don't want to fail so i must you know i i should just hide it away yeah and people do it very subconsciously there's um it, it's not a conscious decision all the time it's sort of this like holding back or they'll invent things like oh i'm not done with it yet or it's not quite ready or Oh, I have this other thing I have to do. I'm going to get back to that. I just have to do this yeah, thing. Yeah, we, 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 keep, we keep postponing it. Yeah. And it's the truth that I've, I've done that many times with, with different things. And what happens is that over time, you lose interest over that thing anyway because you're, 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 you change. And so right. your thoughts about your own work change. So the most important thing is that you make and put out, make and put out, like, you know, like, fill up empty fill up empty because that's the life of an artist you know we express ourselves we put things out in the world and 
they're what we feel right now. And sometimes they're raw, sometimes they're polished. And we're just, we just keep doing it. You know, that's, that's really the most important thing that we're living the life, right. not, not marking ourselves by our finished products, you know. Mm. But at times we like, we aim for perfection. And yeah. while doing that, that's probably the reason why we never get to do the kind of work that we really want to do. Like it happens yeah. with most, so many people. Oh, it has I happened agree. with so it has happened with so many of my friends as well. I have friends yeah. of mine who wanted to be musicians and singers and all, but now they have just completely left everything and they're working in some other industries and you know, slowly and gradually you can see that envy and hatredness on their face and in their behavior. That yeah. They're not getting to do the kind of work that they wanted to do in the right. first place. Yeah, perfection's a killer. I think you nailed it. Um, you know, we have this idea of being perfect people. It starts very and I, young. And, and, and I guess that also comes like, as far as uh, current scenario is concerned, it also comes from social media and what we see on social media as well. Yeah. I don't know if it comes from there, but social media definitely exacerbates it. You know, right. it, it, it pokes at us. It gives us a view in other people's lives, curated views. Right. Um, we look at other people's work a lot. So we end up in a comparative mindset while right. we're going through it. Instead of just appreciating, we're looking at it being like, wow, that's really good. My work isn't as good as that, you know, or, oh, that sucks. My work's better than that. Instead of just appreciating, you know, and so, but the perfection thing starts very young. That's with our, that's in our families. That's, in our, where we grew up, our culture, um, influence stuff that comes at us and who we're supposed to be in these formative years. Right. We're born perfect. You know, our parents love us no matter what. And, and we feel that and we're hugged and held and loved if, you know, if all things are going right. And then something happens where we start to realize there's other then things. We, in the world. Then we get educated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and um, that's where we start to learn this idea of perfection, you know, mm -hmm. and trying to and get constantly back. comparing ourselves with others. Yeah, it's it, re it truly is the, you know, the downfall of us, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the thing we have to try to get a hold of and get control of in our lives, you know, and. Mm -hmm. Photography is a great metaphor for all of that because, you know, we're, we strive for the perfect image, you know, mm. when, when we frame things right. and, and we give direction to something or we wait, you know, for that moment to click the shutter or get up really early in the morning so that we can get the right light over the mountaintop. Right. All of that is a pursuit of perfection. You know, we're all, we're trying to make something of beauty and we just have to be very careful about about our expectations within that you know it's okay in my mind to look for beauty you know and to be around it you know right. like getting up early in the morning to watch the sun come up mm. in in budapest you know over the bridge you know is like you know that's a noble noble thing to want to go do to do it only to create a portfolio piece mm -hmm. to have people perceive you as something is less noble to me. That you know? would be so, a complete waste of it, I guess. Yeah. You go, you go because you get to be there. The photograph right. becomes, you know, a token of your experience of having been yeah. there. It's not, yeah. it's not the, it's not the goal, you know, necessarily. Right. It just becomes an extension of your own experience. Yeah. You've experienced something and you know, you have clicked something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, I think that's the message is, you know, and it goes back to your thing about curiosity and maintaining it is the camera comes with you because you're a, you're a photographer, right. but you're the movement, you know, the move mm. forward, which I always think most of life can be tracked by your, uh, 
what do they call it? Your um, incentive or your motivation to right. move forward in your life to move, you know, like you start dying either physically or, you know, emotionally psychologically. Yeah. when you don't move, when you lay mm. still, you know, and so pushing yourself forward always, no matter what's happened to you, you take right. another step and you move forward, you move forward. I think that is the key of curiosity is you're always going forward. You're always pushing into things to experience new things. And the camera comes with you. You know, the, what makes you a photographer is that you do that with a camera, but everyone right. should, everyone's doing that in their own way. They just, That's not, some people bring a notebook. Some people log it all up here. Some people have a guitar, you know, it's, right. it's different things, but we're all, we're all are just trying to push forward, you know, mm, in one way or the other. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 I truly believe that. So, uh, coming back to photography, I want to ask you, what do you think is the most important aspect of photography? Do you think the uh, aesthetic aspect of photography is more important, or the storytelling aspect of photography is like uh, more important? What, what do you think about it? Well. It'd be easy to avoid that question. Uh, I'm going to try to do it directly. Because <laughs> um, I feel like most people, you know, you'd, you'd be like, well, it depends. What kind of photography are you doing? You know, but I, I think it, I, I think the question deserves a tangible answer. And I think the answer is that it's not aesthetics. It's not, it, it can't be aesthetics because aesthetics keep changing, you know. Um, the most important thing is that you capture an emotion mm -hmm. in your image. There has to be a feeling in it. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the images that have lasted through time and that affect us the most are right. ones that somehow made us feel something in that still image. I right. feel, you know, uh, there's an image. My mother bought this image. Um, let's see if you can, can we see it uh, up there. That was the, that, yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Uh, that's a photographer named Carl Mydens. I probably could have just taken it off the wall and brought it down here. Um, no Carl Mydens was a you know time photographer, uh, Life magazine photographer, war mm -hmm. correspondent photographer. Mm -hmm. This was an image he took. Um, I think it's called Woman in Fog, Swansea, or Swansea, England, Swansea, England. And um, he was he was on vacation at the time, you know, and he, he took this image of a woman walking across the street early morning. And um, my mother bought it because it made her feel something. She didn't know who Carl Mydens was. She didn't know, you know, necessarily like, his style of photography and and this wasn't even his normal style it was just like she fell in love with the image of this silhouette of this woman carrying things you know with the weight of what she was carrying in this setting which is actually a fairly normal setting and um there's all kinds of reasons why this image is technically really really good but it wasn't why she bought it, it wasn't why she was mm. affected by it that image probably affected me more than any other thing you know, in my childhood probably led to a lot of what I do because that's what I saw as photography. My mom loved it and right. I want to love anything my mom loves, you know? So, mm. yeah, um, it's emotion, you know, the most important element of a photograph is what emotion is it conveying for you? You know? Mm. So I don't know. I can't, I can't think of anything more important than that. You have answered it really well. I mean, Oh, good. Yeah, I'm trying to and think. I can't think of anything else. So it was a nice question, I guess. Yeah, beautiful question. Um, and I'm I'm glad I could find something, <laughs> you know, that that I believe in. You know, works really well. It's hard, you know, when you get. I worry in an answer like that for a younger photographer. Mm. You're left feeling like, how do I do that? You know, right? Yeah, because it's too complicated. It, it's complicated and your training is shutter speed ISO and aperture and right. lighting and then composition mm. and then this sort of like find the moment thing, you know, and like right. it's so much to hold in here. 
to then be told, oh, the most important thing is emotion, you know? I, Boy, how do you translate that as a younger photographer? You know, I think that's, I think that's tough. I think that's really hard. Um, you know, there's been a lot of quotes that are meant to sort of help. I mean, one of the ones people throw out a lot is, you know, and I've said it many times, if you want an interesting photograph, photograph something interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but where does that leave the woman walking across the street by herself? That's true. Like, That's true. <clears throat> Who's to and say? Then, and, and 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 at the end of the day, the interesting that that in yeah. interesting incident, the definition is completely different from all the for all the people. Yeah. Like if, if there is something that you find interesting, it's not important that it's not like it can happen that I don't find it to be interesting. That's right. Yeah. There's there's a whole genre of photography called toy photography. Okay. <clears throat> Where people just photograph little miniature toys and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. has no emotion to me. Like I have, I, I have, like I can't get my my heart rate won't rise over that subject, you know. I, <clears throat> but for the people who shoot it, it's incredibly interesting and emotional. And like, I'm sure there are other people who seeing it actually makes them feel really emotional I, too. So, you know, you have to. You have to be okay that your work is going to be really appealing to some and not appealing to others. I've had something happen in my own trajectory. You know, I've shot everything, shot almost every genre of photography I've done a couple times at some point. And my mainstay is documentary, but the photography that people resonate, that resonates with people the most of mine by mm. far is the dance photography, you know, like this I, stuff. I, <clears throat> and I've had to come to grips with this reality, which is that that is the work I do that makes people feel the most emotion. Mm -hmm. And there's reasons for that. I've, I've thought about why that possibly is. Part of it is dance itself, you know, is... I, is but also my style combined with dance mm. creates something special for people, you know, be, um, just the way I do it. I, I have a deeply collaborative relationship with dancers and choreographers. Mm. I've really studied it and I've really like come to like, I, it's a true bringing together of things, you know, it's not just me, but I've, le I've learned to like not fight it, you know, like, right. If if that is creating emotion, I want to do that. You know, I want to I want to do work that is evocative and makes people feel things. But I can't tell you how many times people go through my portfolio right. and are like, "Hey, you're yeah, you're a really good photographer, but your dance photography, oh my god!" You know, like I get mm. that all the time. I'm like, okay, you know, I get I get what you're saying. You know, that's the one right. that makes you feel things the most. Mm. Uh, but, so but, but, but let's say let's say people don't like. The kind of work that you do, dance photography. Let's say hypothetically, would you still do it just because you love it? Probably. Although I might not do it as much. Um, I'm very sensitive, you know, right. to to feedback. Like and where uh, do you where do you where do you draw the line between doing something that people like and doing something because you like doing it? Yeah, another very insightful question. But I think <clears throat> the answer is that every artist needs an audience of some kind. True. You otherwise, there is, there, uh, otherwise, there is no motivation of that sort. There can be no. intrinsic motivation. That, yeah. can, that is like internal motivation, but you need some sort of validation out there as well. I think so. I think we need validation. We also, you know, like it's our nature. We're, right. we're social, we're social beings, you know, we're not meant to be on the planet by ourselves. So art is what we share with our community and everyone wants to be valuable and useful within their community. So right. if you're spending all this effort doing art, you know, if you're, if you're a cook, your value in a small group is, is all it's there. It's intrinsic. You know, right. like you provide the food that they eat, you know, mm. but that's still social. That's still like 
that's still getting feedback from if they don't like your food you're gonna adjust your food you know I, like <laughs> so art is the same in that way in that we put it out to our community and and we want them to like it and give us that feedback that's totally natural right. so to some extent if you're doing work that isn't resonating out there right. you're probably going to veer into other territories mm. you would try to convey the same emotions you're saying you're trying to express yourself creatively but i do think you're going to want to create work that people look at and be like right. you know you're adept you're you know you're doing a good job at that even if it doesn't resonate with me like <clears throat> i think of i know plenty of people who in their older ages took up painting you know right. and you see it we went to the arboretum a couple of weeks ago which is a beautiful 14 acre you know plot of land out in los angeles and it's trees from all over the world from india from uh <clears throat> other like from japan from all over and there's there's people out there they they troll they come out with their carts with their canvases and their paints and they sit there for hours and they paint you know and and they're you know these are people in their 60s and 70s and this is but this is very common you know people pick this up are they doing it for the appreciation or are they doing it because the painting connects them you know <clears throat> it didn't really matter what style they were doing to me what I mattered is that they were out there they enjoyed the process of doing it. So that's the other side, which is that sometimes we just do these things because we really enjoy it and it connects us to nature and other things. And so it's this weird balance where you, you'd have to do it for yourself. You have to acknowledge that a certain amount of appreciation helps I, and you like, you weave through those two things constantly. right and you know as far as art is concerned art or photography is concerned many, many many people believe that art has a purpose for like social commentary or serving some sort of you know societal purpose as well to do something great in great for society as well so yeah. do you think your artwork has something to do with that like do you often uh, like think about these things how your work will like impact a person out there in the society i used to when i was younger i've given up on it to be honest mm. but do you think it's like a lot of pressure on your head to think about these things it's pressure i've just never seen it play out you know there's there's famous images over time that get credited for right. influencing culture especially war photography mm -hmm. <coughs> um sports photography right um but i've seen a lot of photojournalists sports photographers who i've known who do this year in and year out over and over and i can't say that their work has changed society yeah they've filled up you know they've marked moments you know and I, <clears throat> but if they really changed the way society looks at things i don't I don't think so and i think like you said it puts it maybe puts too much pressure on it um i prefer to look at photography as you know an art form and um a tool for creating things but also collaborating with other artists and you bring it <clears throat> to a situation where in the best case for me you're as a photographer one element of many things going on right and you plus all those other things create something mm, right um, we as a culture we, uh lean toward credit you know it's this hero's journey uh we have in the west more than you have in the east but right where the individual has to be great you know and so credit i took that photo mm. you know this becomes this sort of heroistic thing mm. and in truth you had a camera and muhammad ali you know won his fight mm. and all these you know thousands of people gathered to watch right. the fight and the lighting people lit the lit the the <laughs> ring and 
you were one of many people in that scenario mm. you know, who I, who helped cr that moment come to life it's not a the photographer didn't do that you know and that's how i view dance that's why i love dance photography so much when i come onto a set or in a place where you know sometimes it's site specific things like i went to qatar for you know three four weeks uh in okay. december with a dance company <laughs> during world cup mm -hmm. We're going all around Doha and all these areas, you know, and like mm. shooting and doing performances and like, I'm just one, there's a filmmaker, there's dancers, there's choreographers, there's these environments, there's lighting, there's sound. Mm. I'm just one of many in this element, you know, but I'm happy there. I'm so happy there. The images came out beautiful, but of course they did, you know, like it wasn't all on me to do yes. that. I just, you know, I was... I knew how to get in the right place, you know, at the right time for these, because I was watching these performances three, four, five times in a row, you know? So, so basically it is like dissolving your own, your own ego as well in the process and realizing yeah. the fact that it's not only about you. There are so many, uh, you know, things working together, you know, to, to, yeah. to create something beautiful. I think so. I mean, I, I believe in almost any, there are mm. types of photography, some fine art photography in particular, where the artist does everything. You know, mm. I'm thinking of like some Cindy Sherman things, for example, where, you know, you're really dictating how everything goes here. Right. And the, it might also be me. And I make myself up in a certain way. Um, or, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, Baldessari, you know, whose imagery, it didn't really matter what the imagery was so much. It was what he did with it, you know, putting a, you know, a round sphere, you know, colorful ball over a person's face or something like that's an individualistic thing right. that he will get credit for, you know, mm -hmm. that's important too. So it, you know, that can happen. It's just not, the photography I think you and I are talking about is more workmanlike photography, right, right, you know, right, right. journalism, documentary, um, all kinds, you know, portraiture, landscape. Right. There's all these things that involve many things in what we do, you know. So, and in that way, I think you're right. I think you go in completely egoless, and um, that puts you in the right mind frame. Right, right, right. So uh, apart from photography, what are the you know other avenues that you find inspiration from? Like, are you into movies or something like that? Yeah, over the through the pandemic, I tried to teach myself as much about filmmaking as I could, mm -hmm. and it's been another journey, long one, humbling, because like cooking or tennis or you know any endeavor. You know, I always say like with tennis, you can walk onto a court with a racket and hit the ball over the net, you know, like that's not so hard. But right. when you try to do a backhand or you try to serve or you try to like right. return a thing, like you're like, oh crap, you know, like there's so much here. I don't know. There is so much <laughs> complexity involved in it. Yeah. Filmmaking is like that. You can hit record on your camera and get beautiful footage. You know, that's not right. hard. But if you want to like tell a story, woof. There's, and you know, like there's all this stuff to know. And so fortunately in this day and age, YouTube exists and we can get, you know, tutorials and stuff that we weren't able, I wasn't able to get when I was young and, and people were shooting on film and it was prohibitive. So now it's like, I just went in and I started learning all these aspects of it and you get to, I call them the mountains of learning, you know, I <clears throat> there's the mountain of lighting you know, just to learn good lighting and, and how does a cinematographer position themselves to get light, you know, or how do they influence the light by diffusing it or right. using, you know, we understand in photography, key light and balance and these kinds of things, but now we're talking about lighting a scene. Mm. So that's a mountain. Sound is an entire mountain. You know, how do you, how do you get good sound in an interview? Right isolate it and make it sound good it's all these you know like learning sound was so hard because people who are good with sound are literally engineers you know right, and so they engineer. they speak in engineering terms they use 
things like decibel gain, e right. EQ. You know, there's all these words like, I didn't know what any of those things meant, you know? Mm -hmm. And and they don't know that they're talking in engineering language. That's just the language they know, you know? And so you right. have to decode all of that. Be like, what does that mean in real terms? And, um, you know, I use ChatGPT and other things to like help me understand things in terms I and I that I can actually do something with. So I went through this process of just kind of like trying to understand it all. And then, you know, got myself, I had to go through like, which camera do I want to use for filmmaking? That was a whole other mountain to kind of like mm -hmm. figure out. Um, and understanding the difference between full frame sensors, super 35 sensors, these kinds of things. I only had a cursory understanding from photography because I've used full frame sensors for so long now. I don't quite get, I didn't get the ratio difference, all this stuff. Focal lengths are different on a super 35. You put a 35 millimeter on a super 35, it's not 35 millimeter, you know? And like mm. those kinds of things were boggling my mind. I finally got a grasp on all of that, figured out what camera worked with my style of shooting and what kind of style of shooting I wanted to do, which was handheld. And then, you know, started rigging out the camera and like, you know, like figuring out like what I wanted on it, needed on it to do the work I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it started coming together over the last six months here. Do you now have like a clear picture of like, what do you want to do in the filmmaking arena? Yeah. Yeah. It just started to crystallize for me. You know, I love documentary, um, but in particular, I like... You know, what's cool about this is it it's much more like my photography than I thought from a storytelling standpoint, you know, right. because with photography, I like I like to be with artists of different kinds. It's what I've always loved in photography, whether it's a musician, um, a fine artist, you know, a dancer. These are all like these art forms. I love to be amidst them with my camera, my art plus your art. And right. now I'm kind of doing the same thing with filmmaking, filmmaking which is um <clears throat> you know i like doing some sports things but like creative sports things like soccer I you know i work with a soccer club here and we do really interesting cool things it's artistic and fine artists i've worked with a number of fine artists doing short films uh and then of course dance films you know are a natural extension of my dance photography mm -hmm. so <clears throat> I, I really like doing that. And then where I really want to push it is into more avant-garde filmmaking, right. start to incorporate spoken word, my poetry, some things like that. Um, and you want to get into I, direction as well someday? Direction? Direction, yeah. Yeah. Um, I like directing a lot. You know, I still, I love holding a camera. So right. it's a fight, you know, like, do I give up the camera to someone else and just direct? Um yeah, I think I would like doing that. I don't think I'll ever give up holding a camera. But um, for some projects, it might be really good to do that, you know. And, yeah, I've been doing some commercial work as well. Um, yes, I've seen them. You know, which is my old world. And in those periods, yeah, I'll bring in a DP way better than me who can do right. the high end. Stuff, and I will direct in those scenarios. Um, so, yeah, I'm comfortable to let go of it if I have to. For people way more talented. Yeah, that's than what I. that's what that's what I yeah. wanted to ask you actually. Are you comfortable like giving away those cameras to somebody sure. else who is better than you in that aspect of? Oh yeah. <clears throat> well, DP work is it's an entire world. You know, these most a lot of these DPs they're coming with a full lighting package, right. grip, you know, one ton truck filled with <clears throat> diffusers and stands and lights and all. all this stuff you know i don't have and you need right. um they also have this incredible ability to make anything happen mm -hmm. you're in a house and like the light's not right they will make the light right you know right. and then there's stabilization there's you know moves that you need there is there is so much of technicality that goes in yeah right. um not to mention sinking and you know all this other stuff and i really love i i don't like to pretend that i can do all that and so when a scenario comes up where you where that would really be beneficial 
I'm, right. and if there's money, I'm more than happy to let someone else do all of that, you know. Right, right, right. So tell me, like, tell me, like, what are the, what I, what I, who are your favorite filmmakers, like, who really inspired you? Whew. Um, I'm, it's, it's hard for me to find, to think of, like, someone who didn't have some effect on me, you know, but I really, really love to watch um, um, Stanley Kubrick movies, for example, um, for specifically for their visual approach. Right. Right, right. He's, you know, he was this wide, wide angle guy, you know, <clears throat> And what he was able to do with extremely wide angle lenses and the way he was able to convey emotion in his films. And I'm just like hopping in my mind from like, you know, um, Clockwork Orange to, of course, 2001 Space Odyssey, but also The Shining or um, what was the, um, the one, the one, the war one. Um, I'm blanking, but like, I mean, he's always like finding ways to get like incredible emotion with wide angle. And then, you know, I'm also a big Tarantino fan. Um, and I think he just does such an incredible job, like with hyperbole, you know, so mm -hmm. he's able to push all the way to the edge of like reality in order to convey emotion in a kind of like extreme way. And I think that's a real skill. Um, I'm of course like a big fan of Wes Anderson um, because of his composition. And as a photographer, of course, I'm you know a huge fan of composition. And so um, just watching what he does with color composition, um, you know, is mesmerizing mm -hmm. and um I, I love watching Coen Brothers movies for the same reason. They're incredible with composition, but I feel like even more than Wes Anderson, who still is in that kind of like hyper real world, I try, I try. the Coen Brothers are more real, you know, but like mm -hmm. what they do is I feel like the Coen Brothers are like an extension of photography with what they're doing mm -hmm. from a right. composition storytelling standpoint. Like I feel in it the way I do with a really beautiful photograph. And then, um, you know, and then I'll find like DPs out there, um, a lot of the Polish uh, DPs and Japanese DPs. These days, there's so much work coming out of Korea that, mm. you know, is just like mind blowing. Uh, have, you seen, have, you, have you seen Iranian movies? Uh, I think there, I, is this, not, there, is this, there is this famous director. His name is Abbas Kiristami. Have you heard about him? I don't think so. You'll have to. I'll have to go deep on this. You must check his work. Okay. Yeah, would, he's would just love. phenomenal. He he's also a photographer as well. Okay. He has directed so many movies. There is this uh, one movie. Uh, it is the Taste of Cherry. Uh huh. Taste of and Cherry. Taste down. of Cherry. Then there is another one. The first movie that I watched of uh, Abbas Kiristami was Where Wind Will Carry Us. All right. Well, we'll have to. You and I will have to keep sending each other links. For sure, for things. sure. You you are going to love Abbas Kiarostami's work. Okay, great. The kind of visual poetry and cinematography he uses in his movies is mind blowing. It's wow. like cult cult classic. Amazing. All right. Yeah, I ah. got another thing to go deep in. Sounds great. Yeah. Amazing. It was lovely talking to you. You as well. Thank you. And. uh we can do it anytime you like. We can, sure. you know, I know our time difference is, is right. severe, but, and I know it's late at night. So thank you for staying up tonight. No, no, me. no problem at all. No problem at all. It's Good. completely fine. So we can do it like some other time as well. Again, great. We can talk about movies and all, all the stuff. Would love to. Well, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. All right. Take care. Have take a good care. one. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks care. for having me.